First leg of the trip. I'll go in and look at the model of the old fort. Yeah. Had to depend on the European market to supply them with essential military goods. And it was through ports such as Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah that, uh, uh, that the lifeline of the Confederacy uh, evolved. And uh, Wilmington. Well, the, the Federals, of course, targeted very early in the war Wilmington for capture, uh, but it took a back seat to other important objectives, particularly along the Mississippi River, Vicksburg and, and New Orleans. And then there were other ports in the South Atlantic that the Federals thought were more important than Wilmington, particularly Charleston, which was sort of the symbolic cradle of rebellion to the Northerners, had that symbolic importance, uh, as well as the, the material importance. Uh, Wilmington became increasingly important as the other Confederate ports were either closed off by the Federal Navy, the blockade itself, which was established in early uh, 1861, or failed to combine land and sea operations. Uh, Wilmington, uh, I think its longevity was due to five main factors, at least is what I argue in my, my thesis. First of all, geographic advantages, uh, good interior lines of communication and transportation, uh, strong uh, fortifications, good military leadership, and then Union priority and apathy. Uh, the first one, uh, geography, uh, as you know, the Cape Fear at that time had two navigable mouths. The old uh, inlet, or the main channel, which is the main channel today, uh, down near Southport, and then of course New Inlet, which is that shallow little passageway just at the tip of the Federal Point. But that gave blockade runners an, uh, an, uh, a choice of entrance into and exit out of the river harbor. So that, uh, and it was also difficult for the blockaders themselves who had to, to separate into two squadrons to cover both entrances because of uh, Bald Head Island and Frying Pan Shoals, which stretch way out into the Atlantic for like 12 miles. So they had to divide into two squadrons, and it was almost impossible. It was sort of this a cat and mouse game that they had to play with the blockaders. So the blockaders, as they approached the Cape Fear, could see where the heaviest concentration was that particular day, and he could either could uh, make landfall south of Old Inlet and uh, come along the coast just behind the breakers uh, until they had to make that final dash through the dragnet into Old Inlet, or they'd go north of New Inlet and come down the coast. Uh, and then uh, the, the advantage of doing that, of course, is that they had Fort Fisher, the guns of Fort Fisher to protect it. Uh, as you know, Fort Fisher was the strongest uh, and largest permanent seacoast port in the Confederacy. Uh, it stretched, it had two faces in sort of the shape of an inverted L. Uh, the sea face uh, was about 1,300 yards long, although Colonel Lamb says it was about 1,900 yards long. I think it's a mistake. Uh, I take my uh, evidence from uh, the Union official reports that were done two weeks or 12 days after the fall of the And uh, those engineering reports say that the sea face was 1,300 yards long. The, the land base, and, it, and that's all that's left of it now, you know, was uh, uh, about 500 yards long, stretching from uh, close to the river all the way to the ocean, where it formed a, a huge bastion. And, and Stanley, that's what you were talking about, that huge hill that you used to see as, as a young man. Right. That was the main fort itself, what was called Fort Fisher. And then, of course, it turned at a right angle and went down the sea face for 1,300 yards. Mm -hmm. Now, Battery Buchanan was a mile further away right at the tip of Federal Point. And uh, Battery Buchanan had plunging fire into the channel itself, into the New Inlet Channel. So Where that would the, somebody like the Stevensons have lived where they could see all the stuff the river? Well, that were the only people who lived on what we today called uh, Pleasure Island were just watermen, pilots, uh, and, and that's about it. Not many people at all. It was, it was virtually just endless sand hills all the way from here to Wilmington. I thought she was live, they were living at the fort with, with the Lambs. Okay, now the uh, Lambs family built a house on what is today the Air Force Base. Is it still there? Or did they close that down? They closed down the Air Force Base. Okay. Uh, there's a, a, an old battery uh, 
a mass battery called Battery Hollow that's on that old property. And uh, the Lamb's house, where he kept his wife and his little children, was right on that, uh, right on that property. That house is still No, it's, it's been gone. It, I think it was torn down about the, the turn of the century. Because uh, Lamb said that he visited about 1898, somewhere in there, and said that a couple of fishermen were, were living in it. Let's, let's walk around. The interior lines of communication and transportation are the railroad. Uh, yeah. Wilmington is connected by three main railroads. Uh, the most important of which, of course, was the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, which connected eventually up to Petersburg, Virginia. And that, of course, in the last days of the war, was Wadley Lee's lifeline. Uh, with the closure of all the other ports, uh, Wilmington was the last port uh, effectively open to, to overseas trade. So he had to have that. Uh, competent military leaders. Uh, the port was first started in 1861. The man who was most responsible for its construction was uh, Colonel William Lamb of Virginia. Uh, his superior force was William H.C. Whiting. Who, as you know, was not a good uh, battlefield commander, but was a, a brilliant engineer. He he graduated or was graduated from West Point, number one in his class in, of 1845. He wouldn't have gotten to be the defense secretary, would he? No. <laughs> Whiting was one of those guys who was uh, a modern man. He was uh, not your, your typical Victorian character. He was brash, he was outspoken, uh, and uh, he, he managed to isolate. Uh, or antagonize uh, Jefferson Davis and other you know, big, big guys uh, by his outspokenness. Uh, he called his face. <laughs> this, this is the runway that was pushed through during World War II, uh, so that all this part of the, the land face was broken. But uh, by some accounts, the land, well, the land face ran for 500 yards all the way to the river. And you can see, of course, part of it over here now. But, uh, now, Chris, would the Sally Port have been somewhere still on the... the Sally Port was right in front of us. Where the museum is? Yeah, right where the museum is. It's where they come into the port, sort of the center of the land. I don't know if I get in your way, Stan. <laughs> As a kid, Just I remember later a run. wooden watchtower down here. Where would that have been? Do you have any idea? Does anybody else remember a wooden tower that I had been... It was a metal one. It was, stay, it was back up here. Was it a metal one? I climbed it many a time. No, there was. So that was later then, or yeah. was that? Yeah, okay. much later. There, there, I do have a photograph from oh, the 1880s, I guess, of a wooden uh, watchtower that was located south of the fort, because you can see the land face in the background. Wow. It, it was down that way. Walk around behind the fort. You see if we can get up on, uh, on Battery Shepherd. Oh, so Buchanan was right down there, right near New Inlet. Yeah, it's still yeah, there. It's still there. We're, Is it? We can ride down there and take a look. It's not much, it's just a sand dune. Although they put a little uh, wooden flag stand. Oh, they did? Yeah. You get a nice view when you climb up on the hill. Let's see why they put a <coughs> Fort Fisher was an amazing piece of engineering. Uh, constructed of sand as opposed to masonry forts, which had been popular prior to the war. Uh, but those were easy to reduce with the, the, uh, the big guns that had been developed by the time of the Civil War. Sand, on the other hand, was just like a sponge. You, know, you could fire a big 15-inch shell into it and explode and, and make a hole fit 50, uh, about five feet deep. But uh, you, know, you could easily repair that. You just fill it back in with sand. Uh, the land face uh, itself, uh, the curtain was about 25 feet high, and as you can see, these huge reverses in between contained either a, uh, a bomb proof uh, in which the soldiers could take refuge during a bombardment, or an alternating magazine uh, where they kept ammunition, gun powder, that kind of thing. And this was the character of the land face uh, the entire way to the sea face. And then it made that right angle turn and the first 100 yards of the sea face was of this same massive character. But after that, 
I should have bought my photographs along. After that, there was a series of uh, uh, isolated batteries connected by a little small sand hole that ran or almost three times the distance the land place. Of course, we, there's no way for us to tell whether it was 1,300 yards or, or 1,900 yards long, as Lamb says, because, of course, the sea face has been washed away for, what, Stanley, 50 years? At least. Easy. Easy. What Go happened on. was it was a Kikina rock barrier half a mile north of the fort that uh, was busted up and used for road fill so that people could come down and visit uh, uh, the fort and uh, the end of the island. And, uh, once that was busted up, however, that allowed the current to come in closer and just eventually take all this away. So when did that happen? When was the sea face? When was that thing busted up? About 1932 or something? Uh, sometime around just before the war. But until that time, you can hear old timers talk about, you know, the entire fort being here. And oh, there was Dr. A road. Bales, I'd love to yeah. tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> More than you want to hear. Right? Well, was this then a, a fairly uniform height in what's happened? The, 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 the magazines have rotted and collapsed in now. Is yeah, that... and as a matter of fact, they've restored one on the very far end. Let's walk down there and take a look at that. Yeah, the the uh, the parapet itself was 25 feet high, but these traverses in between the gun chambers were another 12 feet above the parapet. And between each one of these traverses, you can see the little dip down there. A gun or guns sat in here. That was the gun chamber yeah, the overlooking the land approach to the fort. And then the Confederates cleared off for a half a mile above the fort, all of the forest up there, except on the far uh, west bank. That allowed the Federals to, you know, approach the field and approach on that floor. This growth of trees on your left, yeah, are apparently, since all this is cleared, cleared. Now. had all to be all, all this was cleared. They got slaves surrounding the farm plantations to come up and do the work. I think at one point he had like 500 slave laborers. But uh, Lamb said that. Uh, from the time he took command, July 4th, 1862, until the fort fell, January 15th, 1865, they worked at least six days a week and sometimes seven days a week. And the fort was still incomplete when, uh, when it fell. And Buchanan, you can see off on the left. It's right there. They were actually barracks uh, constructed behind the fort, but after the first boat, they were destroyed during the first bombardment, completely wiped out. The soldiers were furious because they had all their extra clothes and blankets and everything in there. And said that for, from then until the fort fell in January, they were freezing to death because they had nothing. But those nothing pictures to of them when the, they took after they the fort fell, it looks like they're standing against things like that. Well, after the after the first bombardment, they were forced to live inside these things yeah. for the most part. I would have been in there right quick. Seems that's good. Have you seen all those pictures? Yeah. Not usual good that many pictures of this side. Are there in existence in this fort? I only know three. Yeah. Three? Just three. That includes the ones that were taken from the Devious Skirmish. 
Uh, you mean the Whitworth Rock? Whitworth Rock. Where is that? Is that oh. the famous flagpole? Uh, <laughs> That's the, the one that got you right. in so much trouble? Oh my God, don't tell me. Let's not talk about that now. <laughs> well, there were. You and Lawrence Lee? Me and Lawrence Lee. Duking I thought it, you were going to invite him to come. Duking it out. Right. Uh, the land face had 20 big Seacoast guns. And, uh, uh, eight inch uh, Columbiads, 10 inch Columbiads. Uh, there were 32 pounders. Uh, the sea face itself had 24 big guns, and then there were cohorn uh, cohorn mortars in the, in the in the back. Now the Federals claimed that when they took Fort Fisher, they found some 60 other tubes in inside the fort that at some point were going to be mounted. So Lamb himself says the fort was incomplete when it fell. I still had a lot of work to do on it, even though they worked six and seven days a week the entire time that he was commander for about two and a half. Years. And who did all that work? Lamb. And his I mean, slaves and soldiers. Slaves. He had some 500 slaves at one point and soldiers. But well, didn't I didn't I read somewhere that when it was time to harvest, they sent the slaves back and conscripted poor some poor whites and they, they did County. hire some white laborers to do the work too. And there was and, a lot. Now of you told me that James Post uh, had, had something to do with this uh, construction of Fort too, didn't he? Well, not that long. It's a yeah. yeah. You, she, uh, Diane, in May, gave me a little article that said that he had uh, designed something. I can't remember now what it was. Uh, what can you see? Okay. See, oh, I'm land. Did they use sandbags? Yeah, yeah. I wish I bought my phone back. It, it, it's a wonderful shot. Yeah, here's what we got here. There's a wonderful shot. Uh, Fort Fisher. Next to Fort Sumter is the most photographed thing of Fort. There are, I've collected now 44 photographs that were taken immediately after the fall of the uh, oh, Fort. Uh, they were taken uh, in February, early February. And it shows Federals re restoring the Fort for defensive purposes. And there's this wonderful shot of this chamber. And the, and the guy has his camera set up here. And you can see the, uh, uh, the fort and you're inside the gun chamber. You can see all the way down the land face. And you can see the guys working on restoring the palisade fence, which I don't think you can see from, from up here. But uh, of course, there were two attempts on the fort. The first uh, failed attempt in, in December of '64 uh, that was, was turned back. Uh, the bombardment turned out to be ineffective. In fact, Lamb says at least one third of the shots from the fleet uh, were, went into the marsh beyond the fort or into the river. And uh, General Butler, who as you know was uh, the Army commander, the Union Army commander, landed only one third of the troops that he had with him on the expedition. They came up and reconnoitered the fort and said, listen, your bombardment has done nothing. I told Porter that his bombardment had done nothing. and. Uh, then an attack would, would probably fail, and so the attack was called on. And uh, Grant, General Grant, of course, was furious when Butler refused to dig in and lay siege to the fort, which was his implications in, in his orders to Butler. And uh, so Butler was sent home to Massachusetts and uh, replaced with a man named Alfred Terry, who was given command of 8,000 troops and told when he got back down here with Porter to stay until the fort fell. Uh, the, fort, the, the fleet returned on January 12th. The bombardment was renewed on the 13th. And for three consecutive days, uh, they unleashed some 21,000 shells on the fort as compared to about 20,000 shells the first, I think that's about right, the first uh, bombardment. So that some 44 to, or 40 to 45,000 shells were fired on the fort in the two bombardments. I don't know how many millions of pounds of, of, of iron that was, it's quite a bit. They said the descriptions where you could walk across the, uh, the level land of the fort and, and walk on metal all the way across after the bombardment. Without stepping on anything else but iron frags and cannonballs and stuff. Terry landed his entire force on the 13th, started on the 13th. Now, Lamb had only about uh, 1,300 effectives in the fort during the second bombardment at first. Uh, eventually, that was put up to about 1,900. Although Lee, General Lee, who of course by that time 
that late in the war was surrounded at Petersburg and was uh, facing a war of attrition with Grant, sent word to Lamb. And this is verified by a telegraph that Porter captured when the fort fell that said, if Fort Fisher falls, I cannot maintain my army. So the, the message was very clear. He had to have Wilmington open, and if Fort Fisher fell, of course, the, the river would be cut off. So he sent to uh, reinforce uh, and help in the defense uh, General uh, uh, Hoax, uh, Robert F. Hoax uh, division of troops, uh, about 5,000 guys. Hoax was a North Carolinian. But to command the defenses itself, to oversee the defenses, uh, he sent Braxton Bragg, uh, who was a, uh, an incompetent, uh, quarrelsome general, not popular with, uh, with his troops or with other generals, but was a favorite of Jefferson Davis. They were best friends. When Bragg was sent to Wilmington, uh, local <clears throat> papers said, well, here comes Bragg, goodbye Wilmington. They predicted That's the That's what end. Richmond yeah. papers said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Richmond papers said that. People, of course, were furious that he was going to supersede Whiting. And Whiting, even though he was brash and outspoken, <coughs> people like that. You know, he's sort of an Oliver North. You know, you, you, you handle the big guys, you know, you go after them, tell them where they stand. Anyway, they were furious that Whiting had been superseded. Anyway, Whiting comes to the fort and to help out to volunteer his services to Lamb, who he gives uh, the direct uh, uh, command of the, of the defense itself. Bragg brings his forces down to Sugarloaf, and we'll visit the Sugarloaf lines in, in just a little while, and entrenches his force there for the first bombardment. But after the first victory, he withdraws all of his troops and takes them to Wilmington for a grand review so that the, the citizens of Wilmington can clap and applaud and say, yay, good victory, you won. Well, he didn't think that the Federals would return, but Lamb and Whiting were, were, were convinced that they would. So they set about restoring the fort into a defensive position again, making necessary repairs, fixing up the palisade fence again, and getting ready for this other attack. The fleet returned on the night of the 12th. Bragg did not even warn uh, Lamb and the garrison that the fleet was returning, even though his watches undoubtedly saw the fleet going past Wrightsville Beach and, and Virginia Creek and all that heading in this direction. As a matter of fact, Bragg was told about the return of the fleet by Colonel Lamb at the fort. So that by the time that Bragg returns to Sugarloaf with his 5,000 troops, General Terry has had enough time to land his entire federal force of 8,000 guys and construct his own defenses facing north toward Sugarloaf, where he knew that, that Bragg would be, and uh, giving him about half that number to attack the fort. Where there was a two-pronged attack plan, uh, the army was going to come down the west bank here and attack the land face, this side of the land, or this end of the land face, while at the same time Porter uh, accepted 2,000 volunteer sailors and marines to attack the, where the land and the sea face met, the full bastion. Uh, so on the afternoon of January 15th, the attack uh, uh, took place. It was started with a, must have been a beautiful thing. Uh, all of the, the steam whistles of the fleet blew simultaneously. It must have been an eerie sound. The Confederates knew exactly what was happening. And of course, they'd been holed up in their bomb proofs for the most part because the bombardment had been so terrific. They could not stand at their gun chambers as they'd been able to do during the first attack because of the inaccuracy of the, the fire of the fleet. Well, as soon as the, the uh, steam whistles of the fleet blew. The Confederates knew exactly what that meant. They came pouring out of the bomb proofs, came up onto the onto the fort to, to meet the attack. Uh, of course, in the meantime, the army had been massing for the assault, oh, uh, several hundred yards in front here. Uh, the sailors and Marines had been massing. Uh, they landed at Curie Beach, formed for the attack, and moved their way down uh, for their for their segment of the attack. At 3.25 p.m., the attack began simultaneously. Sailors and Marines dashed down the beach. Uh, they had been given cutlasses and revolvers and told to board the fort. <laughs> and when you get on top, throw the soldiers over the side, you know, like, <laughs> some, like they were trying to take a ship or something. You know? Well, that was disastrous. Lamb had to defend the land face at that time only 1,000 guys. Now, there were some 500 still on the sea face that were fighting the fleet. He had 1,000 guys. Uh, he had uh, 650 North Carolinians, 
had 350 South Carolinians that Bragg had ridiculously sent downriver on transports. They had landed at Battery Buchanan and told to run across the entire mile distance to help in the defense of the land phase. So they're running across the interior of the Fort Fisher. Meanwhile, the shells are exploding all around them. You know, they're taking casualties. They run the, the entire distance and reach the fort just at the moment that the attack begins. Lamb says, listen, I need you on the far, this western end down here to protect that, this part of the fort from the, the army assault that's, that's coming. In the meantime, he took 500 North Carolinians and literally took them up on top of the parapet down there on the, where the land and the sea face met with General Whiting to stop the naval assault. Now, uh, some reports will say that, that, that uh, Lamb thought that, that was the main attack. That's wrong. He did not. Lamb knew that the Army assault was the main attack. They had 3,300 guys, uh, federal troops, coming this way. But he knew, too, that if the, the naval assault was successful, that, of course, the fort would be bisected and the end was, was inevitable. So he needed to turn that back first, and he did. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was like shooting ducks. Uh, they come running down the beach full force. They lost all sense of... Uh, staying together, uh, all sense of order, they just, just this giant mass of, of Union sailors and Marines charging down the beach. And the, the Confederates stood up on top of the parrot and just, just blew them away. Uh, there were some several hundred uh, Federal sailors and Marines killed in a very short period of time and... Uh, what happened to all those bodies? Some of them drowned. Many of them were buried. Uh, national cemetery. The national cemetery. They took yeah. them to the national cemetery. A lot of them. A lot of them were, were taken up there eventually. Them. No, because they didn't wear dog tags in those did days. Did they ask you? Well, one I'm, dumb thing. How did the federal army get here? Had they ridden? Up, did they walked or ridden from another place, or did they come by boat? They were landed at Curry Beach landed. and 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 constructed fortifications there to protect their rear. Left uh, two brigades of black troops in the trenches, and then the white troops came down to make the, the attack on the fort. And uh, so while the the Union Naval and, and, uh, and sailors uh, attack was being turned back down there, the Army in the meantime was attacking this very point right here. Uh, there were only at that point 150 North Carolinians to turn back 3,000 or three brigades of federal troops because the South Carolinians refused to fight. They were exhausted from having made that trek across the interior of the fort. They hold up in the bomb proofs. Major Riley tried to get them out and couldn't do it. Whiting and Lamb on the other end of the fort, you know, meeting the naval assault. So it was easy. The, the Union Army just overran, overwhelmed the, the 150 Confederates that were down here. Uh, finally, when the uh, naval assault was turned back, Whiting and Lamb rallied their troops, turned around and, and looked down this way toward the, uh, the west end of the fort, saw that the Federals had planted several of their flags on top of these traverses. and said, oh my God, we're being overrun down here. Let's get down there. So they rallied their men and made a desperate counterattack to try the, to drive the Federal Army out of the fort, which by that time had, had established a foothold in here. And we'll walk on around there. But this is where they made the attack, right over this point right here. The, the fiercest part of the fighting were over these very traverses right in here. And uh, we can walk around by the town. And Traverse here. is the proper name for these. These big mounds in between the gun chains, which contain either a bomb proof or a, uh, a magazine. It's, it's actually a magazine. It's almost directly across the ship.
another one right here. And you see the other ones right there. So they, they go out almost to the river. So my, I think that when Lamb says the land face was yeah. 682 yards long, he was taking into account the Palisade line. But was this all marsh then? or did This was all marsh, but it was all cut down. Chris, you think the fact that the, you think the fact that this is a salt water flat that the salt helped preserve it? Because I would have think it rot anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just being in this mud has protected it. But you know the old gravestones used to be wood, and there practically none of them survived. Here's a nice shot. Sun shining on them right there. These things will be gone one day. Chris, wouldn't there be a lot of metal out here in this marsh? There's a lot of metal in this marsh. A lot of metal. Uh, particularly when you consider that one third of the shells from the first bombardment went into the marsh and into the river. So you could take a, a mag, some type of metal find and walk through here and find plenty of all kinds of stuff. It's also illegal. <laughs> it's state property. There's a wonderful story now about his father's effort to find his son killed out here. His son was a sergeant in the third New York named Edward White. He was killed before he ever reached the fort. He was killed out in front of the fort. When his father received news of his son's death, uh, he was intent on, on recovering the body. So he immediately secured permission and uh, got passage down to, to Federal Fort. Just after the fort fell, I mean, Wilmington had not yet fallen when he reached Federal Point to try and find his son's body, which was not going to be an easy task because the, <coughs> the soldiers, for the most part, were just turned over and sand was thrown up on top of them and a headboard stuck on them. But they weren't usually marked. Well, <coughs> he got down here, thought that he would be here for a long time trying to find his son's body. Uh, he got permission from the, the local Union commanders to uh, get some soldiers to help him locate his son and found his son's, uh, some of his son's friends from, from his regiment. And one guy says, well, I, I know about where he went down. Let's go see if we can find it. The second grave that they dug into, they found his body. And uh, so he uh, had a casket constructed down here and uh, took his son back to New York, buried. And it's in it's in one of the 1950s American Heritage magazine. His story about his trip down here to recover the box. It's a wonderful story. Yeah, that against that. One of the <laughs> absolute second body he looked at. Amazing that he would be able to get down here so quickly to learn of his death yeah. and then to make his way down. Listen, he was down they here. They really moved in those days. They got around. He was down here within two weeks after yeah, falling. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Do you, you know, I found one letter that said they were mad as could be that it'll take them five days for a letter to get to New York from to what terrible service. Yeah. <laughs> now this is this is the traverse where General Whiting was was wounded uh, by several accounts. I've run across several accounts where it says that General Whiting went down on the fourth traverse. In that counterattack, he and Lamb rallied as many men as they could from the the uh, northeast back and, and came flying down the top of the, uh, the parapet, the land face, hoping to drive the federal wall. Whiting himself was leaving the top of the And he was running on top of the parapet. He was running on top of the parapet. Sword in hand, revolving in another hand. And uh, as a matter of fact, the accounts I've read about this were in Union accounts. The guys were so impressed. And here's this Confederate general, you know, like a madman, cussing and screaming and yelling and, you know, describe this son of a bitch here and he's out of the forge, you know. And, said that, that Whiting uh, was grappling with a standard barrier, one of the regiments that took two shots in, in the hip and went down. And uh, he was carried to the hospital, uh, which was which over. Was it was, it's gone now. It was uh, in that uh, very close to the Fort Fisher itself, that land and sea place where that was. Uh, after that, 
Lamb tried to rally, uh, his, or did rally his men for another counterattack in the interior of the fort. Uh, by about four o'clock, the Federals had not only taken uh, oh, half a dozen of these traverses, because each one of these things became a little fort, with, uh, with Confederates being in one gun chamber and on top of the traverses firing into another, literally point blank range and hand to hand, and then they'd fight for traverse from gun chamber to gun chamber to gun chamber. So it took several hours for the Federals to, to gain control of the whole uh, uh, land phase. In the meantime, they had come around back into the interior of the fort here and were uh, charging across the plain. Uh, the Lamb, about four o'clock, rallied his men and, and set up a counterattack. And uh, on his count, one, two, three, four, they all jumped up and started the charge. And just as he Lamb jumped up, sword in hand, he took a ball into the hip and went down. And that pretty much ended it. Uh, the, the morale of, of the soldiers at that point was was wavering, and the fighting continued until about nine o'clock, when uh, when General Terry, the Union commander, sent in an additional brigade of fresh Union troops to do the mopping up. And at that point, after five and a half, six hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Confederates were completely overwhelmed and exhausted. Uh, Lamb, at the moment of the attack at 3:30, never had more than 1,500 effectives, as compared to the well, so the odds were two to one. Uh, against him just as far as the army was concerned and uh, so about 10 o'clock that night they made their way down to Battery Buchanan where the, the surrender took place and that was it. Chris, go ahead. Yeah. What about the 5,000 bone guard? Didn't do a damn thing? Not a damn thing. There's a wonderful uh, uh, telegram. All this was going on. There's a wonderful telegram that Barry has just found. Uh, uh, lamb of Whitey just before the attack started, uh, Bragg had his force up at Sugarloaf. He had made that feeble attempt just hours before the attack finally came to get troops landed at, at Battery Duquesne, but it was in full daylight. The transports come humping down the river. The Federal fleet can see all of this happening. These are the 350 South Carolinians? Well, Carolinian. he sent an entire brigade. He sent a brigade of South Carolinians, a thousand guys, on transport. But they got down to Battery Buchanan, and, the, and the, the Federals just opened up on the transports and drove them off, so that only about 350 were able to land. And, and Lamb was furious. He says, well, here's the commanding general. He's sending these guys down to broad daylight and full view of the fleet. Who's this guy think he is? <laughs> He's supposed to, you know, uh, defend Wilmington? This guy's in combat. Of course he was. Of course, what were his alternatives to get troops down here then? Could have done at night. Why didn't he send them down here at night when the Federals couldn't see him? He could have sent them down to South Fort and crossed them back over that way, if nothing else. He had the Chickamauga, the CSS Chickamauga Confederate gunboat in the river that could have protected them all the way down. He didn't use that. So Bragg contributed nothing. Nothing. Just before fort, the attack. got a fort named after him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris, this is a dumb question, but I, I know they had the telegraph coming into the Darius House in, in Wilmington. But would they have had a string of telegraph poles from the fort to different the places to, to communicate back and forth? All the way to Wilmington. And they were still communicating with uh, uh, with Bragg by a telegraph line that apparently went across the river. There was a, a, a telegraph station over uh, at a battery that was south of Fort Anderson, and they were sending messages up that way to Fort Anderson and then back across to Sugar Line. How that was going on, I'm not sure. And how far could a telegraph go to the next station? And what's the distance? I, I don't know. I don't know that much about communications in those days. Well, they, they, in all the Civil War battles, wasn't there good communication pretty well? Uh, certainly not to compare the communications that we have today. Oh, no, they were, they but were, I mean... They were very crude, but uh, yeah, they did have telegraphs. Uh, Bragg did know what was going on inside Fort Fisher. Yeah. I, I thought uh, there's a wonderful good. telegraph that was that, that what was is sent Bragg? That, that, that said, uh, uh, General Bragg, attack, attack, it is all you can do and all I can say. Uh, and, he, and he didn't. Uh, Chris, is there any significance to this rise right front of I'm not sure what, what this meant, um, except that all of, the, all of this ground back in here, fourth, was, uh, was torn up to build the fourth itself. There's a wonderful photograph 
from, from Mo Sullivan's uh, stuff. The painting of that. And it shows this giant hole that at the time the photograph was taken was filled with water and there are a couple of tubes, cannon tubes down in that hole. And you can see garbage from the fight. There's a cartridge box and some uniforms all scattered out back in here. description of this wild man confederate uh, oh, really? which reiterates the other or was there a journal just found that was kept at the fort during the war that's it that's exactly what it is journal kept at the fort during the war mm. and it's a couple of hundred pages mm. and a guy wanted not, i mean he wanted very little for it he wanted something like three thousand dollars and he gave now, how does that go, Beverly? He gave archives of history or somebody 30 days to buy it, and yeah. he had an outside offer of something like 10000 mm -hmm. And they were debating whether or not to do it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> they were debating whether to do it. Now, this was right. back Garrick in... Garrick said he'd walk up there. This was back in October years. when I heard about it. Because they, they but called they did me, get and it. I told them they, 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 they did get it. They did get it. Yeah. And they were going to bring it down to the fort. I think there was some discussion about that, but now they decided to keep it up there. And they just never well, when are they going to publish it? Uh, they, they got local horses down here, didn't they, and it uh, bald head